Okay, I'm going to talk about our software called Kodi. It's an open source home entertainment system. Uh, I'm Martijn Keizer. I'm the release manager and project manager as far as we actually have those titles in the team. So what is Kodi? Uh, we are an award-winning software, so we won some awards in the past for best game. And uh, on SourceForge, we're the largest open source net, uh, multimedia project since a long time. We're uh, free and open source, and we're having uh, GPL2+. Plus. Uh, we support every common uh, retrieval method for media, local to network, streaming, uh, we run on basically any platform, Linux, Android, iOS, Windows, FreeBSD, any hardware. Um, we originated on the Xbox, well, uh, which I'm going to talk about later. There's still an Xbox port still running that's almost up to date. So how are we different? We, have a, we do have a unified interface to view pictures and videos and music across all platforms. So whatever platform you have, it's always the same. We pioneered the 10-foot interface, so the large screen, in, uh, like any TV. Uh, we use a skinnable, um, the skins are using XML, so you can completely customize them. Uh, all the platforms use the same code base, basically C and C++. We have some differences be because of the rendering towards the video end and uh, the audio, but it's like 95% all the same code. Uh, all of our add-ons are written in Python. We're now working on binary add-ons using C and C++. Uh, the interfacing we use for web interfacing and even in the add-ons itself, it's all JSON RPC 2.0, if I can correct, uh, which gives you total control, like settings, playback, uh, retrieving files, uh, media libraries. We're also the first to integrate those features to media consumption. So we started out a long time ago and basically everyone copied us. So how it began, so a quick history. In November 2002, the Xbox came out. In 2002, it was hacked by Andrew Huang. You also see the, the chip that was used to hack it. And in December 2002, the first Xbox Media Player 2.0 was released, which was the first XBMC or Kodi version. Why the Xbox back then? It was network, x86, it was cheap and hackable after 90 days. The warranty was void anyway, so you could do whatever you want. So no year warranty. So just after 90 days, you, it's up to you. Uh, initially, it was a homebrew, required Microsoft XDK. You need to self-compile it. And if you distributed any binaries yourself, that was illegal, so any user had to do it themselves. Um, back then, an XBMC was born. It's totally developed in C and C++. Uh, because the Xbox was a game device, we had to design it around the game. So we ran at 60 frames per second, full time. The, as I said, the GUI library, we uh, use widgets and all XML files to get the textures to show. We have an embedded Python interpreter, uh, what we call add-ons. So we can write any add-ons that use the uh, some modules to interface with Kodi itself. Um, we have now multiple player cores. We have DVD player, PA player for the audio, M player has been removed last year because it was not used anymore. So we only have video player, the DVD player, and audio player, PA player. We rely on a lot of open source libraries ourselves because we use them. Uh, I think that image is missing here. Oh well. So we use uh, SQL, uh, FFmpeg is our most important library. We use Samba as well. So back to XBMC. In 2003, it was uh, more open to the community, more skinners and designers came forward to improve the, the skin. The Xbox also became much cheaper. 
the hard drives were cheap so you could actually store um, your files on the drive itself and the stream media became usable and add-on directory servers are developed so you could actually write add-ons in 2003 to get all that uh, media consumption. Uh, we b became platform agnostics because the Xbox was too slow and early 2007 the Linux port uh, was started. We use this, uh, it used SDL and OpenGL for input and graphics which we now are dropping to use a more modern way. Uh, we had a ton of work to emulate the Win33 API, so we had to do that all in Linux itself as well. <coughs> OS export was done in 2007-2008, and in 2008 the first XBMC named version was released, and that was on Linux, OS X, and Windows. So, when we grew up, uh, the Portman development team grew because uh, it was yet more platforms, more developers becoming interested, and we had to really we realized that we had to st start looking at the future. Uh, donations were still held in a personal PayPal account, so that's not that good. Because if he left, <coughs> sorry, if he left, what happened to the money? Uh, companies also became interested, so that's why we uh, created XBMC Foundation to handle all the, the companies <coughs> and the donations. So it's non-profit in the US. The lawyer cost initially for setting it up was sponsored by Boxy. In 2009, we started working on ARM. In 2011, iOS was done. In 2012, we had a Raspberry Pi. In July, they started on Android. The problems we had is dual licensing because we never imagined how far it would go. We never looked into that. We have no backend server, like Plex does. Uh, communication inside the team was hard because we had no structure and it's all volunteer. <coughs> the interface wasn't that user friendly yet because it's really geeky. <coughs> and the information was not that organized. In August 2014, we announced that we would rename from XBMC to Cody. Um, because groups were claiming to be official XBMC and that started to give problems. And the trademarking was done too late. And we failed to do that in Europe. The source code is, as you see here, it started out in 2003, it grew up to more than 12 million lines and then we started to reduce it again because every developer started throwing code at it no real structure <coughs> so as you see we're here in now 2015 at the end we're just back at five or six million uh, the contributors since 2012 has been stable to like 50 developers so there's a core team that works on it, but we have a lot of developers outside contributing code. Uh, here's the, the picture with all the libraries we use. Some are gone now. Someone made this a while ago. So we rely on all these to run Kodi itself. Development cycle. So the code is public on GitHub. Every dev is welcome to uh, submit this code for review and we will uh, include it. Uh, we use Jenkins for test compiling before actually merging the code because we have six platforms so we need to make sure it runs or actually compiles if it runs that we'll know this next day. <laughs> uh, 
we do daily builds on all platforms. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, every day we build for all platforms, so users can install it, and we notice problems real soon. We now switch to Rero, so release early, release often. We started out at this actually two years ago, trying to make our releases more rapid, more stable. Less features going in in a year or in one cycle. Just do two miners and release. <coughs> and we use monthly merge windows. So if uh, someone wants to add a feature, we do that in the first 20 days of the month. After that, it's 10 days of box fixing, no features. This worked out pretty well because we have like 20 days of new things coming in. And after the last 10 days, it's just stabilizing the code. And we do that for um, <coughs> releasing a new version every month. We use that as alpha version for a uh, public to test. Uh, some distros and forks out there. Uh, Open Elac is the, the major one. It runs on a, it's a Linux distro, really bare bone. Boots up in 10 seconds. It's the main one for the Raspberry Pi. We have Kodi Ubuntu, which is basically Ubuntu that boots into Kodi. Then we also have OSMC and XBN. It's, those are based off uh, Debian. And they also boot directly into Kodi. Um, there are many other forks. There's a wiki which is totally incomplete because we have no idea how many there are. <coughs> so Open Elac is the, the centerpiece. They have a lot of users. It's fast to boot up. It's easy to set up. It's basically install it on a USB drive, plug it in and it runs. <laughs> It's a live CD style, so you can run it from flash or install it on a hard drive. And it's ARM and x86. Some um, in 2008, uh, Boxy became live, which is actually a fork from Kodi itself. <coughs> and they were bought by Samsung for 30 million in 2013, and you never heard from them again. Then also Plex, which is also a fork from Kodi. Recently they, they announced that they switched from Kodi to uh, MVP player. <coughs> so what other known projects there are at home, of course. Schools even use them for uh, media distribution. So they have several monitors in each class and they have a central server pushing out the data or video. <coughs> Museums, exclusive, exclusive hotels. We had contact with a company in Switzerland that uses it in $800 rooms as their main infotainment system. Uh, yachts, cruise ships as well. They, of course, don't announce them publicly that it's Kodi, but we know they use it. The hardware, uh, we recommend actually no hardware because we don't care about that and that's up to you. Because we're multi-platform and independent from any manufacturer. Although, <coughs> to avoid Apple TVs, they're end of life, all winner based and rock chip. All winner is kind of known to be GPL violator and really shabby. Rockchip uh, uses lip stage fright and they released a new um, binary for it, still using lip stage fright. And we actually removed lip stage fright, so avoid those until they fix it. <coughs> and any slower hardware because you. Yeah, and actually now the Raspberry Pi Foundation announced their $5 Raspberry Pi. <laughs> it's, it's okay, it plays video, but don't expect miracles. As soon as you start to run any Python add-on, it's that slow. But the Raspberry Pi 2 is 
basically the lowest you should go for something usable. Uh, so we suggest any x86 like Zotac, the Intel NUC is a very capable device, a bit more expensive. Uh, the Gigabyte Bricks or Chromebox, they're cheap devices, so you need some hacking to get it working. Uh, Android devices, the Fire TV from Android or the Nexus Player from Google. Uh, Low-end ARM devices like the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the Flurk adapter is a really cool device. You plug it in and it acts as a USB HID. And with what it does do? You, you uh, configure it, plug it in any computer and it follows your remote. So you, if you combine your remote with the, the Flurk, plug it in another computer, it works. No configuration needed. So you can even swap out the device and your wife will never know. Um, on Android we have one developer. He's uh, Koying and he does all the, the audio and video related stuff. And in two or three years it's like 33 to 40 percent growth. So from nothing to 40 percent in two years. The problem with Android is the APIs. We started out at Android 2.0 and it was a mess. It was all hacking to get it working. Now with Android 5 and Android 6, they really matured a lot, enough to make it a viable platform. We're also having contact with Google, telling them what they should do to get media running. And uh, the feature set for Android is not that optimal. We still have some things we like to see on Android, so we'll be talking to Google about that. Uh, pass audio pass-through is working in Android 6, so you get HD audio. <coughs> the Raspberry Pi, that's the lowest you can go. And it was a game changer because it's so, so cheap and it became really good for the public to buy and experiment with and that's actually a lot of the Raspberry Pi sold are used for Kodi. Uh, one of the foundation guys, the developer from the is also on our team so he does amazing work on the on the firmware. Even large part of the firmware for the Raspberry Pi is for Kodi. And he greatly helped improving our code base because it needed to run on the Raspberry Pi. And we're used to running on fast hardware. So we actually started improving our code, reducing the, all, the, uh, all the loops and every hack we ever did, we, uh, reducing the power it needed to run. So about the users. We have no exact statistics because we don't track them, so we have no Google Analytics running. Though we, our server counts the amount of downloads we have, so we push out one system add-on. We ship by default, like uh, the, the movie database for getting your content, and we're likely up to 11 million, and that's growing every day. And Google Play says like 2.3 million. And we know there are like 7 million Android devices out there, so not everyone's using Google Play. This is our current hardware or uh, platform distribution. Uh, as you see, Android is the really big part of the, the pie chart. Then we have Windows. Uh, I wouldn't use Windows as a basic platform for a media center, but it's the only one that actually still allows encrypted Blu-rays. So if you have that and a Blu-ray player, that's the only way to play your encrypted files with Kodi. Then we have part of Linux. So the Linux is actually the OpenELEC part, the Raspberry Pis. And Apple is a tiny part of it. And the iPhone, still some Xbox users out there. For the future, so what are we working on? binary add-ons. So in the past we had Python add-ons and now we're working towards binary add-ons. So we can write them in C++ 
We already had them for several years, like the PVR add-ons. But now we're also working for virtual file systems like Samba, NFS, to make those also updatable outside of Kodi. So you don't need to install a new Kodi version to get a bug fix for some platform. <coughs> and we can compile them, update them outside of Kodi, so Kodi com becomes more of a, a framework instead of a real have it all in one place. And uh, audio decoders, audio encoders, so they can also be installed outside of Kodi itself now. So audio DSP. So we had uh, two students working on this for a Google Summer of Code project. So what this does is you get your media, you have, an, uh, you have several add-ons for the, the signal processing and they actually hook into Kodi itself and you get uh, equalizers, free surround, channel mapping, room correction, so basically everything your expensive AVR does in an add-on. So you just need to buy an AVR that does nothing except amplifying and you get to do it all in Kodi itself. Here we have some examples which are currently working. Um, so like a biquad filter, free surround, so that's basically a kind of a Dolby thing. Uh, audio mapping is worked on, so you can actually channel map your speakers differently. Uh, the equalizer can be done per speaker. So not, not a global equalizer, but you can actually have, if you have eight speakers, you can have an equalizer for all of them. And you can configure them. And here have this is the manager they're working on. So we have input resampling, so we can have some add-ons there. And we have pre-processing, master processing, and so up the entire audio chain can be modified with certain add-ons. Uh, the next cool thing is UPnP media import. So Kodi runs at, as a single install, no shared libraries. We have MySQL, which was added years ago. It's still experimental. Nobody really likes it on the team, except some. It's hard to set up. So uh, one of our developers started working on UPP media import. So what it does, if you have two Kodi clients, you enable UPnP, they see each other, and they ask, hey, do you want to install the other one as well? So now you have an instant shared library without any setup. Then it asks, uh, what do you want to synchronize? So do you want to import the media items, uh, playback related, uh, the media data, like uh, the cast, description, ratings. So it will auto-sync that over the network. And it can be done with any client in your home. So it needs to be in your home network because UPP won't work outside. So if you have two or ten, it's just plug and play. If you remove one, it will automatically clean it up again. The other one is Retro Player. It's been worked on a long time. It, it's built around Retro Arch and it allows you to play emulated ROMs from almost any ROM out there. So. What the features are, you can save, so which you cannot do on the old Ataris. You can actually start playing and rewind. So if you die, you rewind and start playing again. So like Super Mario, if you jump in, a, in the fire, just rewind like a normal video. And you start playing again and jump over, over it. And you can even save it. Uh, one single library for all. So it doesn't matter what uh, ROM you want to play or what emulator, you have one library, just install the games you want. Um, included in that is the input rework. Um, the input in Kodi is ancient, so it's done 
from the old Xbox. So he's now, the developers are also reworking that to make it also an add-on. If there's a new controller, you have to do a lot of stuff with XML files or update Kodi. So those will also be add-ons. So, so you can just install the add-on and you have a new controller. Even configuring it will be easy. Just click on the, the controller you have. It will pop up a list with all the buttons and you can remap them on the fly and start playing again. So here we have all the emulators. Not all are available on all platforms, like on Android we have a limited set of emulators, on Windows most are working, Linux is also mostly done. So you can play Game Boy uh, games, MS-DOS games, the old Nintendo, PlayStation, as long as there is there a, if there's an emulator for it and the games are there, you can start playing it. The one problem the one question is, is this legal or not? We have the Internet Archive. Those list all the games. And we are still questioning, on is this legal or not, that they are hosting. Apparently, it is. We had some lawyer looking at it. It's like, it's okay. There are also um, boxes out there that you plug in your computer, you plug in your old cartridge, it rips the file and you have the file yourself, so that's totally legal. Probably. At least you own the game. So that makes it a bit better. Uh, further in the future. So, uh, this year we'll probably release version 16. And version 17 will be a big one. We have one of our audio developers is completely rewriting the DVD player. So he ripped it totally apart, and we now named it Video Player. <coughs> he, he chopped it out in pieces. And what it actually can do, because we don't have transcoding, you can actually use the player to play to a transcoder. And we can have picture in picture, so we can have multiple video players running at the same time. So you can watch a video, and at the same time, push out the transcoded stream to other devices. It's also making it future-proof, because again, our video player dated back from the old Xbox, and everyone started hacking on it, adding stuff, so it needed a lot of rework. Uh, further cleanup in code in all areas, because again, it started out a long time ago, and there was basically no structure on adding features, uh, keeping in mind what the future might hold. So one developer wanted a feature, he, sh he pushed it in, someone wanted something else, he had to work around that other feature. So we had a big ball of spaghetti and we are now trying to clean that up. GUI rendering, because we now we ran in a game loop, we tried to work around that part by, uh, what it called? Uh, dirty regions. So in the past we had did 60 frames per second refresh continuously. Then uh, someone introduced a project for a dirty region where we only updated the part of the screen that actually was updated. But again we're still running in one loop. So video playback and the interface is done in the same thread. So if the GUI is busy your video will stop playing as well. So he's now uh, splitting it up. So whatever your interface is doing or whatever Python add-on is running, your video playback will be running in a separate th thread and will just continue. That also makes it possible to run headless. Because you can still play back, do playback using the, the video player, but you don't need the interface. So you can just shut off the interface completely and run it headless, which makes it like Plex does. Including the video player can do transcoding. Um, what's it called? MB nowadays? It's kind of a Plex server. It's At least it's open source, but we're heading the same way and you have a total in-one solution for that. 
And since we have JSON RPC, you can communicate with Kodi with any uh, application or web interface configuring it, which still needs to be updated a bit. So you can install Kodi on a Raspberry Pi and have that as your server, either UPnP or a headless one, or you can just use it as a pure client that acts also acts as a server as well. Uh, we have also a variety of other projects running. Basically, they're mostly the binary add-ons, like the audio DSP, uh, making sure that the, the binary add-ons will be stay compatible for each Kodi version. So like backwards compatibility we have for the, the Python plugins. Currently for each Kodi version we have to bump the, the, the API version which makes it hard to any developer because they need to follow our code closely to be up to keep it up to date. And we actually have to maintain most of those binary add-ons ourselves as well. Because if we change something in core, it needs to be also changed in the pl all the plugins. And we have now like 30 of them. So we need to update them all. Uh, visualizations and screen savers. They are now also, they were used to be in the, our core code. They are now also put out to add-ons. We're not there yet for having them updated like normal add-ons, but we're working on it. Our plan is to do it for, for Windows because we know that platform the best. Linux is kind of hard because we, if you don't compile them in code yourself, they won't be shipped by default and you cannot add them. So you also need, you always need command line to install those. Android is a completely different one. The problem with Android is if the, the binary add-on is not added in Kodi itself, Kodi cannot interact with it. So we need to the f figure out a way if we need to write another API and then have the, all the binary add-ons just as APK, which you need to install through Play Store or whatever way. Because if you now install them like a normally Python add-on, you can simply not run them. So we need to ship them by default. Um, not sure any other projects that might we were mentioning. We have some, but that's kind of team only for now. Um, how can you contribute? Because we're a small team, I think like 10 to 20 core developers spread out over Android, Windows, Linux, also uh, Skinner, so there's also part of the team, Python writers, uh, server administrators, so we only have like 20 people as a core. We get a lot of contributions from outside of the team, but we always welcome people who wanted to help us develop and extend this project. It's, it's kind of hard to um, contribute because our code is such hard to follow at times. So two years ago it was nearly impossible to contribute because you need to in really know our core code and it's now becoming more easy. Um, so we need developers, people who want to invest some time and certainly testers who want to test edge cases. Uh, at the moment Android, iOS and OS X all have a single developer. So uh, Android has one for audio and video. iOS and OS X is the same one. That's only, uh, it's also only one person. And since it's all our hobby, we don't have a lot of time to do that, so we get a lot of complaints from users. Why don't you update? And it's all our free time. So, that was my quick overview of what we're working on, the history of Kodi, and why we also became from XBMC to Kodi. It was basically the trademarking that killed us, so we had to change to Kodi. And to be honest, 
in the team itself, they're kind of sick of XBMC as well because it's hard to pronounce. So we made wanted something easier to pronounce as well.